Okay, welcome back. So we are talking about energy and work in cells um, and the difference between a closed and open system. So a closed system would be what you see at top here. Eventually it's going to reach equilibrium and no work is going to be able to be done. Um, luckily though, our cells are not closed systems. Our, closed, our cells don't reach equilibrium. They are open systems that are constantly having a flow of materials moving in and out. We're constantly breathing in, we're constantly eating and drinking, we're constantly bringing things into our cells um, and our cells are open. So they're able to um, have processes that will not reach equilibrium and be able to, do, to get energy and do work. So that is a defining feature of life. Metabolism is never at equilibrium. And we're able to do things like catabolic reactions that can release energy through a series of, re of reactions. Um, so there's an example here of a hydroelectric dam that releases water and as the water moves, it spins and releases energy. The water moves some more, spins, releases energy. The water moves some more, spins, releases energy. Um, and our cells are like that. We can do things like pass electrons down a membrane and release energy. ATP is the energy shuttle in a cell. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So A for adenosine. This is based around the nucleotide um, adenine. Um, it is also has a ribose sugar on it. So adenine and ribose together make adenine or make adenosine. Um, and then triphosphate. Tri means three, so it has three phosphates on it. Um, this holds a lot of energy because these phosphate bonds between those phosphate groups those bonds are very unstable. And so you can take, our cells can break one of those phosphates off. So you're left with an adenosine with two phosphates, adenosine diphosphate or ADP, and inorganic phosphate, and that releases energy. Um, if your cells are digesting food and have a lot of energy, they can use that energy to combine ADP and inorganic phosphate to make ATP. So this can move both ways, depending on if your cell is needing energy to be released or has energy that it needs to capture. The phosphate groups in ATP can be broken by hydrolysis. Hopefully you remember those reactions. If not, go back and, and read where we talked about different types of reactions. Um, and if you take a phosphate from something and put it on something else, it is called phosphorylation. So if I had a molecule and I put a phosphate on it, I would be phosphorylating that molecule. In this previous slide, if we go back, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Where am I now? So in this slide, if I took ADP and put a phosphate on it to make ATP, I am phosphorylating ADP to make ATP. Okay, and I think I missed this slide. Um, I'm gonna actually mute what she's saying and we're just gonna talk about it. So this is what ATP looks like. So right here, this is your, well, this is your sugar. I'm sorry, this is your sugar, this is your adenosine, and these are your phosphates. So each little purple is a phosphate. So you have three phosphate groups on here. So this is ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. If you took one of these phosphates off, you'd be left with two phosphates. You would have ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And if you took off another phosphate, if you're left with only one phosphate on it, you'd have adenosine monophosphate or adenosine or AMP. So here you can just see, oh, there's a nice view. Your adenosine, your sugar, and your three phosphates. Okay. Okay, so those three types of cellular work that we talked about in that last video, they are mechanical, transport, and chemical work. Our cells are able to power all of those because we are hydrolyzing ATP. In hydrolyzing ATP, ATP we are um, releasing energy, and that energy can be used for all the endergonic uh, work that your cell needs to do. That endergonic work is going to take ATP and hydrolyze it into ADP and inorganic phosphate. Then you're going to have energy from some sort of catabolism. You're going to be getting energy from the foods that you're breaking down. That is going to be extragonic and release energy and that energy from your food is going to be released to take ADP and inorganic phosphate, combine them to ATP. Then that ATP is used for work your cell needs to do. Then that ADP is used 
to make ATP from digesting food. Then that's used to do cellular work, to break down and give you ATP. So again and again, this is just settling um, so your cell is able to input food energy, or if it's a plant, input light energy, um, to create ATP and then use that work for cell work. So overall, these reactions are exergonic. So even though this is exergonic and this is endergonic, put together they're exergonic. So put together they are releasing more energy, which eventually is going to leave your system as heat. So some of those types of work we saw, transport work. So this is what we talked about in the last chapter, transporting things across the cell surface, requiring energy. Um, active transport takes that energy. Um, will transport your substance and leave you with ADP. Transport um, mechanical work, this is what we talked about a couple of chapters ago when we talked about cytoskeletons. And um, you have motor proteins that can move things along your cytoskeleton. That takes ATP to move them. Okay, um, a lot of these reactions, even though they're exergonic, they are going to be so slow if they happen by themselves that it essentially is you're going to die waiting for it, like literally, you die waiting for it. So instead of dying, we are going to speed up those reactions. A catalyst is a, a chemical agent that will speed up a reaction. Um, also important, catalysts are not consumed by the reaction. So they make the reaction happen, but they're not a substrate. They're not a product. They start and end that reaction exactly the same. They're not changed or used up at all. In our cells, um, the main catalysts are going to be a proteins that are called enzymes. That's a word we've talked about already, so that should be comfortable with you. You can see in this picture, so here in blue, this is the enzyme. This is a substrate that is going to be converted into product, um, and it's going to come and fit in the active site. The active site is going to be specific for that substrate. So this enzyme is going to bind to this substrate. Um, maybe you can make a drug that's similar that would fit in, but it's not going to do other reactions. It is only going to turn this substrate into products. And when it does, you get an enzyme substrate complex. That means the enzyme in blue and the substrate in red all together, an enzyme substrate complex. And you can also see that this enzyme kind of changes its shape from this shape. It kind of hugs in around that substrate. That is called induced fit. So the enzyme changes its shape to better fit the substrate, and better wrap around the substrate. Um, induced fit also allows the chemical groups on the active site to um, move into positions that make it, um, it enhances the, the reaction occurring. So here is, you have two substrates, enter this enzyme, here's your enzyme in purple, and you form an enzyme substrate complex. Um, that enzyme is going to have induced fit holding them together and cause that reaction to be catalyzed. It's going to speed up the reaction, release the products, and then go back to being the enzyme. The enzyme alone is exactly how it started the reaction, and it can go back and pick up new substrates, turn them into products, go back to being a plain enzyme, pick up substrates, release them as products. It can go back again and again and again because the enzyme isn't used up. The enzyme isn't changed or destroyed or altered in any way. That enzyme can keep repeating this cycle, keep creating products um, at like a thousand times a second. Um, some enzymes even work faster than that, can do more than a thousand reactions in a second. Some, react some enzymes are going to be slower than that, maybe only do one reaction in a second. The way enzymes work is they lower the activation energy of a chemical reaction. I feel like we might have talked about activation energy already, but if we haven't, Activation energy is how much energy it takes to start a reaction. Whether that reaction is endergonic or exergonic, um, bonds aren't just going to just break apart for no reason. There, It's going to take a little bit of energy to start and force that chemical change. And that's called activation energy. So in this reaction, you're going from these reactants to these products. Products have less energy, they're releasing energy, but it's not going to happen spontaneously. It's going to take this much energy from the line up to the black, top of the black curve. I'm going to take that much energy to make that reaction happen. That is its activation energy without an enzyme. But if you throw an enzyme in, you get this red curve. So the activation energy with the enzyme is only from the dotted line up to the top of the red curve. So that's a lot less. From the dotted line to the red curve is less than from the dotted line to the black curve. So it takes less, less activation energy. 
that means the cell doesn't have to spend so much energy creating that, causing that reaction to happen. Um, and it also makes the reaction happen faster. So by having that enzyme, that reaction is going to happen at a rate that is actually meaningful for the cell to be able to survive. Some ways that enzymes lower activation energy, one is it orients substrates correctly. So if there are two people who are eventually going to meet and fall in love, but they have a best friend who hooks them up um, and introduces them to each other, they orient themselves together. They're going to hook up a lot faster. Um, if there is a couple that is eventually going to break up, but they have a friend that points out the problems in their relationship and breaks them up faster, that reaction is going to happen faster. That's another way that enzymes work. They can strain substrate bonds and eventually just break that substrate apart. They can provide a favorable microenvironment. So, you know, your friends are dating and you just create this nice little dinner environment where, you know, it's easy for them to fall in love. So they're providing a favorable microenvironment so it's easier to form those new bonds or by covalently bonding to the substrate. So it's going to bond to the substrate which makes it easier for the substrate to undergo the reactions um, necessary for that. Um, necessary for that um, reaction to occur. Okay, let's watch this little video clip. So make sure you're comfortable with everything that was in that video, how enzymes work. Um, there's also a couple of Amoeba Sisters videos in the lecture um, provided as supplementary videos or something like that. Sometimes enzymes need to be activated by something else, and those are going to be cofactors or coenzymes. So cofactors are parts of an enzyme that are not protein, but they help that protein work. Um, they could be inorganic, something, something like a metal ion or something, or they can be organic. If they're organic, they're called coenzymes. Um, that would include things like vitamins. And also some things can cause enzymes to work better or, or work not as well. One of those things is pH. Most enzymes are going to have an optimal pH, um, and if it's too far... Um, acidic or basic compared to its optimal pH, it might affect those secondary and tertiary structure of a protein so it loses its shape and loses its um, active site so it's not able to function anymore. Temperature can affect enzyme activity. So if it's too cold, there's just not going to be enough um, like thermal energy for it to really work as well. So they're going to work best at, um, at some temperature. But if you get hotter than that, you're not just adding thermal energy and making it work better. You're going to start denaturing your protein, um, which is going to leave you with a non-functional enzyme. And then ion concentration can also, affect, um, can also affect your enzymes because it'll change those chemical interactions. It'll change how um, that enzyme is interacting with itself to keep, those, to keep itself folded. So with ions inappropriately around, it will also denature and not be functional anymore. You can also affect enzymes by adding inhibitors. Inhibitors are things that inhibit an enzyme. 
So adding an inhibitor means you have reduced the enzyme's functionality. A lot of drugs are going to be inhibitors. They are going to be able to inhibit, um, you know, maybe inhibit a bacterial enzyme so bacteria can't grow and cause inf infection. Maybe it, inhibitor, maybe it inhibits an enzyme in your body that is um, relaying a pain signal or causing your body to do something inappropriately. So inhibitors work as pretty good drugs. There's two types of inhibitors. One is competitive and one is non-competitive. So a competitive enzyme is what you have here. Competitive inhibition, I'm sorry, this is a normal protein here um, binding to its substrate. Competitive inhibition is in the middle right here. So this inhibitor is going to bind to the active site of the protein. So instead of the substrate binding to the active site, if it is bound to the active site, it is blocked from the substrate binding. So that substrate can't work, can't, or that substrate can't bind to the enzyme, which means the enzyme is not going to convert the substrate to product. You have just inactivated that enzyme because that competitive inhibitor is blocking its access to substrate. Another way you can affect an enzyme is instead of binding to the active site, it binds somewhere else. Any inhibitor that binds somewhere else is called non-competitive. So it's not sitting there blocking the active site. It's not stopping the substrate like that. What it does is it binds to this other site anywhere else on the protein. And when it does that, it causes the protein to kind of change its shape. It kind of shifts around to accommodate that inhibitor. And when it shifts around, it changes its active site. And this change in the shape of the active site means it can't block, it can't bind to that substrate anymore. So instead of having this nice shape that just fits the substrate so perfectly, it has this distorted shape. So that does not affect, that. this distorted shape does not bind to the substrate. So you don't have the substrate being converted into product. So non-competitive inhibitors also inactivate the enzyme. Um, sometimes inhibitors will bind and then release. They might be just temporary. Some inhibitors might bind permanently and that enzyme has to, you just have to make more enzymes before you have the enzyme available. Also the presence or absence of cofactors. If you don't have a cofactor, you can't activate the enzyme. So without cofactors, your enzymes are not going to work either. Okay, and it's really important that we can control what enzymes are there. Um, because it would just be chaos if you're just making all the enzymes and whatever is going on. Um, so a cell is able to regulate what enzymes are there by switching on or off genes for specific enzymes. So if it needs a specific enzyme, it's going to turn that gene on. If it doesn't need it, it's going to turn it off. Then once the enzyme is made, um, the enzyme isn't going to stick around forever. It'll eventually wear out. Um, but in the meantime, once you have an enzyme but it's still hanging around functional, you can also regulate its activity. One way we can regulate activity is by feedback inhibition. We talked about feedback inhibition the very first chapter of class, so I hope you are already familiar with this phrase. Um, but in feedback inhibition, um, you are going to have this whole pathway that makes something. So in this example, we are making an amino acid known as isoleucine. Um, if you start piling up a lot of that, you don't need to pile up too much. So once you have a lot of it, um, it's going to send a signal that, hey, you got enough, you can stop making me. Turn your energy to doing something else. So this isoleucine is going to come and bind to, um, to the, first, the first enzyme in the pathway. It's going to do non-competitive inhibition. It's not binding to the active site. But through that, becoming its own competitor, it stops the whole pathway from happening. So you, when you have a lot of isoleucine, it stops the pathway so you don't make too much. So feedback inhibition occurs when there's an overproduction of a substance and it stops the cell from wasting its energy, wasting resources to create something that your cell doesn't need. Okay, so that covers up chapter eight. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, you're always welcome to my office hours. That's what my office hours are for. And you're always welcome to email me on D2L or through school email. Um, I'll come back and see you in chapter 9 and 10, which are the last chapters we have in this, ch in this section um, before your second exam. Chapter 9 will be covering in class. Chapter 10 will be online only this semester because of some of my um, meetings I have scheduled. So I'll see you all in a little bit.